Okay then, um, the next session that we're going to be looking at here is session 9, which covers the reinforced um, concrete design at SLS. Um, basically, um, the SLS design is covered in clause 7 of the Eurocode. Um, and this covers things like um, sort of just some general stuff. Um, we look at stress limitations, uh, we look at crack control, we look at deflection control, um, and then we finish off with the early thermal cracking rules. Though you will find when we get onto early thermal cracking that the Eurocodes doesn't actually have very much information on this, um, but we'll look at that a bit more um, a bit later. Um, so basically, starting off with sort of some general information, um, <coughs> the um, three different um, sections that are covered by the Eurocode in uh, Eurocode clause seven in detail are um, stress limitation, and this is covered in clause seven point two. Um, we've also got um, crack control, which is covered in clause 7.3, and then we've got deflection control, which is clause 7.4. Um, however, there's also a statement in clause 7.1 that sort of says that um, other SLS limit states may be important as well, but it doesn't actually give you any more detail in that section. But if you do go into um, Annex A2 of um, Eurocode 1990, um, there's also some additional information in there that gives you some um, additional detail on some of the things that could be important to consider for um, SLS. And this includes things like um, partial factors, um, serviceability criteria, um, different design situations, comfort criteria, um, deformations in railway bridges, and um, safety of rail traffic. Um, most of these sorts of provisions are qualitative. Um, but there are some recommended values that are given um, for guidance for national annexes um, that, it, that are provided within that um, 19, 1990 Annex A2. Um, so going on to um, global analysis, um, the global analysis is still covered in Section 5 of the Eurocode, and um, this gives the different methods of global analysis for finding the design actions for um, SLS. And generally, um, we will use either elastic design without redistribution, and that's covered by clause 5.4. Um, but you can also use nonlinear um, analysis if you want to, which is covered by clause 5.7. Um, <clears throat> generally speaking, you will be using um, uncracked elastic methods. Um, and that's just because um, uncracked or uh, cracked analysis um, is conservative for SLS. So generally, the uncracked analysis is the one that you will be used, using. And the reason for that is that a fully cracked analysis um, it does overstate the, amount, the loss of stiffness within the section. And um, that becomes particularly important if you are looking at the in, um, deformed, um, imposed deformation. Sorry, I can't talk straight today. Um, and and that, that's the main reason why you will generally use um, uncracked analysis for SLS. Um, this slide here um, just gives you a reminder of the different node combinations um, that we use for SLS design. Um, I, th I think Chris would have mentioned what these were yesterday, um, but they basically depend on how much load you have on the section. Uh, first of all, you've got the characteristic one, and basically the characteristic um, load combination is the one that we use for stress checks. And basically that's because at no time do you want um, and the stress is to be exceeded, and therefore um, the characteristic combination includes the most onerous combination that you're likely to get under the SLS limit state. It includes full live load and um, so, some temperature um, effects as well. And um, as I said, it's used for stress checks. Um, we've also got the frequent combination. Um, this is slightly less onerous than the characteristic combination, and um, generally speaking, um, we will use this for stress checks in pre-stressed bridges and pre-stressed um, sections. And that's mostly because um, you're a little bit more worried about pre-stressed sections than you are about reinforced sections. Um, we use those. Um, and finally, we've got the quasi-permanent um, combination. Um, basically, this the quasi-permanent combination is just an average load on the bridge at any point in time. And um, generally speaking, for us to, so a typical bridge structure, your live load under the quasi-permanent combination will actually be zero. And um, the quasi-permanent um, load combination will be used for crack width checks 
for um, reinforced concrete um, sections. So um, that's that. Um, the next thing we look at is the different um, stress limitations that are given in the Eurocode. And um, the stress limita limitations are covered in Clause 7.2. Um, generally speaking, um, S uh, stress limitations for SLS are in itself not uh, uh, well, excessive stress rather is not a, really a SLS requirement. The reason that we do limit the stresses of SLS is actually to ensure that the assumptions that you made for the design model remain valid and it's also to make sure that you don't get the deterioration in the structure and that's the main reason behind having the stress limit checks in there. It's not to um, ensure that you don't exceed the stresses because you're already doing that at ULS. Um, that's where you're, you're also checking the um, stresses. Um, if you've got a persistent design situation, um, it's quite normal to check the stresses um, immediately after you open the structure and then you'll also check it 100 years down the line um, just to make an allowance for all the creep um, that's occurred within the structure. Um, that you also do it at that time to make an allowance for any pre-stress losses that you have so you take into account the pre-stress losses at the point of opening the structure and then the pre-stress losses sort of 100 years down the line when you've had quite a lot of shrinkage and creep occurring within the structure. Um, part of the long-term shrinkage effects in the um, first check ha may have to be included um, and that's because up to half of the long of the sort of long-term shrinkage can occur in the first three months of um, uh, after the um, concrete's been poured so therefore it might already most of the shrinkage effects may already have occurred by the time that you open the bridge and um, to sort of vary the um, so take into account this, um, you vary the modular ratio um, and you do that by sort of calculating the creep factor for the different time periods that you have in mind. So you calculate your creep factor for when you open the bridge and then you calculate it for um, the creep factor equal to infinity essentially or 100 years which pretty much gives you the same sort of value. Um, there are some stress limitations that are given in the Eurocode as well and um, they stated on this slide here. Um, so if you've got concrete, um, the compressive stress is limited to 0.6 times the characteristic um, concrete strength under the characteristic combination. Again, the characteristic combination um, is the load combination that gives you the most onerous effects and that's because you never want these stress, um, li stress limits to be exceeded. And that's basically because if you, it's particularly if you exceed the stress in a sort of piece of the, you see the compressive stress in the reinforced or in the concrete rather you end up with cracks occurring and once you've got cracks they're not going to go away or the same thing applies for reinforcement if you exceed the stress limitations and the bar yields it's not going to unyield just because you take the load off so it's a permanent problem and that's why you do it under the characteristic combination so as I said the compressive stress is limited to 0.6 times the characteristic strength of the concrete but um, that stress limitation only applies for the high, um, environment, high environmental classes, the high exposure conditions, which are the XD, XF and XS um, exposure conditions. And um, the reason for that is that high compressive stress causes longitudinal cracking to occur within the section. And, those, and that longitudinal cracking can let in contaminants. So if you've got a high exposure condition, that contaminants will get in and start um, corroding the reinforcement. However, if you've got a longitudinal crack occurring inside a building, it probably isn't that much of a problem because you don't have that many contaminants in there. And because of that, um, you don't have to check the compressive st stresses for the lower exposure conditions. Generally speaking, though, if you've got a bridge, you're going to be checking compressive stress limits. Um, for reinforcement, um, your tensile stress is limited to 0.8 times the yield strength. Again, it's done under the characteristic combination. And finally, you've got the pre-stressing um, stresses where the tensile stress is limited to be less than 0.75 times the, proof the characteristic proof strength. And again, it's done under the characteristic combination. All these um, factors can be varied in the National Annex, but in the UK, they've chosen not to do that. But um, be aware, if you are working overseas, you can be using different stress lim limits. Um, and they can be applying, so just something to be a little bit careful of when you, if you do have a project from an overseas client. 
Okay, um, the next thing we're going to look at is the calculation of the stresses and some formula for this. Um, and basically, uncracked um, concrete cross sections can be assumed for stress and deflection calculation, provided that the flexural tensile stress under the relevant combination of action, actions does not affect the tensile strength of, does not exceed the, if, if, um, the tensile strength of the concrete. However, if you've got large bending in the concrete section, um, you probably will have um, sort of sections that have exceeded the tension, tension um, strength of the concrete, and then that needs to be taken into account. Um, there is a method that's shown, uh, an equation shown here that um, can be used to determine the stresses in a crack reinforced concrete beam or slab. And um, you do that by taking into account um, an effective modular ratio, and that effective modular ratio can be um, derived as shown on this slide here using um, that equation there, which basically just take, makes an allowance of the short term and the long term modulus in the concrete. It also makes an allowance for um, the sort of short and long term um, actions on the structure. So M MQP being the moment due to the quasi permanent effects. And then you've got MST, um, which are the, your short-term effects. Um, so that's how you calculate your effective um, modulus. Um, you then also have to check, calculate um, your neutral axis depth and your s steel strain. And you can do that by um, deriving a, by using a cracked section ana analysis and assuming the plane sections are remaining plane. <coughs> um, based on this, um, we can so that we, first of all, assume that the forces in the concrete are equivalent to the forces in the steel, and we just draw up a stress-strain relation or a stress relationship based, based on that. Or that's shown in this diagram now, up the top. So sort of that bit there, we've just assumed that is equivalent to the, um, the forces in the steel is equivalent to the forces in the concrete. Um, from that, we can then derive our equation for the effective depth that we've got. And that's shown on this slide as DC. Um, <clears throat> from there, we can, once we've derived what DC is, or the effective depth, we can then calculate what the um, <coughs> second moment of inertia is, which again is shown on this slide here. And um, we can then just calculate the elastic section modulus, um, which is just shown um, sort of in this section there. And once you've got that, you can then um, calculate what the stresses in the concrete are and what the stresses in the steel are, but just based on the sort of properties that you have already calculated for the rectangular section. So it's it's not actually that um, sort of difficult. Um, the same method can then be used if you've got a flanged section as well, um, provided that you've got a section that's got a sort of constant width over the bit that's in compression. So if you've got a sort of a section like this, we've got a big um, sort of, uh, flange down at the top. Um, as long provided that the section in compression remains within the flange, you can still use those simple equations. And the same thing is um, can can be done if you've got a sort of constant thick, constantly thick web, which is shown in that um, section beside that. <coughs> um, differential temperature um, for bridge beams. Our calculation of the stresses induced by non-uniform temperature distribution does need to be um, considered. And these stresses include the primary self-equilibrating stresses and the secondary stresses due to the restraint of the deflection and need to be included in the stress check. Um, the analysis to determine the self-equilibrating stresses in cracked sections can be quite complicated and is generally um, very highly iterative as well. However, um, because um, the cracking results in a reduction in the stiffness of the section, Cracking of a section will cause large relaxations of the stresses due to the temperature, and therefore it's generally okay um, if you ignore um, the self-equilibrating stresses in, um, in the section and just um, consider the secondary effects only. Um, neglecting um, these stresses also applies to crack width calculation for the reinforced concrete sections um, where temperature is also included in the quasi-permanent combination for the bridge members uh, which is where one of the big differences between BS5400 <coughs> and the Eurocodes uh, is the inclusion of temperature pretty much in all your node combinations. <coughs> 
Um, if you've got a pre-stress member though, um, where you have decompression um, and sections are generally uncracked, both the primary and the secondary um, effects have to be included in the calculation of stresses. And again, that's similar to what we've been doing previously um, and is consistent with uh, what we've been discussing already. <coughs> Um, crack control, um, which is covered by clause 7.3. Um, first of all, um, you've got uh, clause, clause 731, which states that cracking, cracking shall be limited to the extent that it should not impair the proper function, functioning or durability of the structure or cause its appearance to be unacceptable. Um, clause 7.2 then goes on to say that the cracking in concrete is inevitable in bridges subject to bending, shear and torsion and tension. And basically, just that, that's just saying that you'll always end up with cracking if you've got a reinforced concrete section. Um, but you, you, it's, it's basically just sort of providing enough information to limit those cracks to within the acceptable um, limits. Um, generally speaking, you'll end up with cracks occurring from either direct loading, um, and that includes things like traffic loading, self-weight, um, and things like that. Or um, it can also occur if you've got um, restraint from imposed deformations such as shrinkage or temperature movement. So if you've got a restraint at each end of the bridge and, this, and the bridge then starts expanding and contracting, you, let, you could potentially end up with cracks occurring due to those um, um, actions within the structure. Um, the rules in the Eurocode do cover the effects of both these sorts of actions and um, we'll go over those in a bit more detail in this section now. Um, some other effects that can cause cracking are things like plastic shrinkage, corrosion of reinforcement, or expansive chemical reactions so, such as alkali silica um, reactions. Um, the Eurocode does state that these, um, controlling these sorts of cracks are outside of the scope of the Eurocode 2, um, though if they do occur they can potentially be very large. And generally speaking, we tend to control um, cracks due to that, th these sorts of behaviours um, by using sort of proper concrete mixes and sort of providing adequate cover and um, things like that. So that there's not really any particular guidance given in the Eurocode for it, but it is something that we generally cover um, sort of outside it by just selecting the right sort of concrete for the job. Um, crack widths. Um, Eurocode 2 requires that the design crack width is chosen such that it does not impair the functioning of the structure, either through helping initiate the reinforcement corrosion or by spoiling the appearance of the structure. Um, and the relationship between cracking and corrosion in reinforced concrete has been extensively researched, with, where the alkalinity of fresh concrete does protect the reinforcement from corrosion. Um, this protection can be destroyed through carbonation um, or ingress of chloride chlorides and then um, the cracks that um, form can um, then lead to acceleration of both of those processes because it's letting in contaminants and um, improving the ability of the sort of corrosion to um, corrode quicker. Um, the size of the, fact, uh, the cracks will also influence the time to initiation of reinforcement corrosion and noticeable cracking in the structure causes concern to the public and um, this is actually one of the main reasons why the crack width limits are chosen uh, to what they are. So in the Eurocode, um, we have a crack width limitation of 0.3 millimeters that, have been, that has been chosen. And um, that is basically partly the 0.3 millimeters, the general public will start noticing that the structure is cracked. And it's also, if you start getting beyond that, you start ending up with cracks that let, let in a lot of contaminants as well. So it's got a, a, a double um, reason for that. Um, this slide here um, just shows you the crack width limitations okay, um, that are given in the Eurocode itself. Um, so, if you, and as you can see from this, it is just a 0 0.3 um, millimeter crack width that is given for pretty much all types of reinforced concrete. <coughs> there is a 0 0.4 um, crack width given there for X0 and XC1 um, sort of classes, but that's only that only applies for buildings. And I think it's been slightly modified in the UK National Annex as well. I think you're only allowed 0.3 in the UK National Annex. <coughs> um, and all, all that is an actually in that nationally determined parameter as well. So different countries may have different crack width requirements. But basically, 
0.3 is what we have um, for reinforced concrete. And because we're a little bit more concerned about pre-stressed concrete, um, the crack widths given are just a little bit smaller. So you've got 0.2 millimeters or decompression. And I'll let Chris um, give you a bit more information about the pre-stressing ones in the next talk when he talks about the sort of design of pre-stressing members. So. <coughs> Um, there's also some minimum reinforcement requirements that are given in the Eurocode. And basically, um, the minimum reinforcement that's given in the Eurocode is based on the fact that the, the, the force in the concrete, sort of AC times the sort of tensile strength of the concrete, must be less than um, the force that can be taken up by the steel. And basically, the reason for that is just that um, you don't want the um, piece of concrete to crack and then because it's the concrete stronger than what the steel is the um, steel will just fail in a brittle manner and you just end up with a sudden failure so if you add a bit of a bit of extra reinforcement in there it just means that you end up with a more ductile failure so this, the, basically the force possible that can be taken by the re reinforcement is that a little bit greater than the force that can be taken by the concrete and therefore the concrete will crack and you still have some capacity left in the steel, so you'll end up with sort of some warning that um, something's going wrong. Um, so that's just the basic assumption that, um, that's given up on the, on the first formula on this slide. Um, but that formula is really only applicable if you've got a section in pure tension. And strangely enough, I don't think I've ever seen a section in pure tension. We don't get that very often. We usually have um, sections in, with all sorts of funny forces acting on them. And because that's the typical scenario, um, the, the, the Eurocode has put in a modified formula that takes into account sort of a more realistic situation. And um, the equation given in the middle of this slide is therefore the equation that's sort of given in the Eurocode for the minimum reinforcement requirements. <coughs> um, and here we've just got the AS min times the, the um, stress in the steel has to be um, at least equal to KC times K times FCT effective times ACT. ACT um, is just the area of the tensile zone before um, cracking has occurred within the section. Um, FCT effective is just the um, mean tensile strength of the concrete. So the amount of, so the, 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 basically the stress that takes to, um, the stress required to cause the concrete to start failing in tension. Um, the K factor is just uh, an effect that allows for non-uniform self-equilibrating stresses. Um, you can always use a value of one uh, for this. Um, one, a value of one will always be conservative. Um, and KC is then a coefficient that um, allows for the stress distribution within the section. Um, so if you've got a section in bending, um, you K will equal 0.4, um, but if you've got some axial load in there, it will vary depending on the axial load. And again, that's given in, in the Eurocode itself. But again here, if you use a value of 1.0, um, that will always be conservative. So um, you can do that as well. Um, you then use um, these two tables here to work out um, the, amount, the amount of reinforcement that you then need within the section. Um, I won't go over this these two tables in too much detail now. I'll go over them sort of just later on in the presentation and when we start talking about um, crack with um, check sort of calculations. But for the moment just we can we can just accept that um, we use this for um, the determining the minimum spacing of the bars within the section. Okay, um, the next thing that we're going to do um, is go through the sort of basis of the crack with um, calculation within the Eurocode. And the basic theory um, that the Eurocode crack width um, rules are based on. And um, crack width is one of those areas that you find that pretty much every single crack width professor at a university will have a different theory to um, pretty much every other professor in the world. So um, this is sort of a, a matter of compromise basically. And they come up with a theory that they can sort of agree on. Um, <clears throat> And basically, this theory is just based on the fact that um, if you've got a piece of concrete with a bar going through the middle, and you put that piece of concrete into tension, at some point, point in time, when you've applied enough force, um, a crack will occur within that section. Um, at the point of the crack, 
um, which is occurs sort of here. Um, the stress in the concrete will go to zero, and the stress in the concrete, or the strain in the um, steel rather, will increase um, and take up all of the strain from um, the concrete. As you move further away from the crack, um, the strain in the concrete will increase, and the strain in the um, steel will decrease, um, and that's basically just taking into account the bond between the reinforcement and the concrete. So at a certain point, at a distance of LE away from the crack, um, you will end up with the strain in the concrete being equivalent to the strain in the steel again. Um, so um, at this point, you then continue to um, increase the amount of load in this bar, and um, you end up with a second crack forming within the section. Um, that crack will have to form at least a distance of LE from the previous crack. Um, and that's basically just because the strain in the concrete would be much lower in that distance of LE, which is just this distance um, between there and there. So as you can see, there's less strain within the concrete. So you don't have to end up with a crack forming in this region over here. Um, <clears throat> so once that's happened, um, you then end up with repeating this process until you end up with a distributed cracking at a sort of average distance of about 2 LE over the section. Um, you won't end up with any further cracks um, in the section after you've ended up with that, that distributed crack pattern. Um, you'll just end up with those cracks slowly getting bigger and bigger as you apply more and more load into the section. And um, basically, from that, you can then um, find that the, this distance of LE will be dependent on the, the tensile strength in the concrete, um, the bar diameter, the bond stress, and um, the reinforcement ratio within the section. So that's just a very basic equation shown down the bottom there of the basic formula that you'll use for your crack width calculation. Um, and that is sort of basically what we use if we are using our sort of rectangular section. Um, and it is quite easy to calculate uh, a formula for a rectangular beam in tension. And one thing to be aware of is if you are using the Eurocode equations for um, the crack widths, is that they only really have been they've only really been derived for a rectangular section. They're not really appropriate for any other sort of section, um, which is the same as BS five four hundred. That was only also only derived for a rectangular section. Um, we've only kind of come up with rules to apply it to circular columns and things like that. But you will find as we go on that um, there are better ways of dealing with crack widths um, in the Eurocodes than just trying to apply these equations. Um, the final thing I'll do with this is just give you the actual equations that we get from the Eurocode. Because as I said, that, that bottom equation down the bottom there, LE equals FCT times um, the bar diameter divided by the bond strength and the reinforcement ratio, that's the theoretical um, spacing between tr cracks. It doesn't actually quite fit what you get in reality. Um, so because of that, um, the equations in the Europe code have been slightly sort of tweaked um, to give you a more realistic um, sort of crack spacing. And um, based on that, th this SR max equation is the one that you're given in the Euro codes. It's pretty much the same as what this one in, in here is. It's just that you've got a couple of fudge factors in there to allow for the cover and um, actual sort of testing um, data that you've got. So, but it, it is, the basic uh, formula is based on the, the theoretical result. Um, so once you've got the um, spacing of the cracks, um, you can then calculate what the crack width equation is. And you do that by sort of applying this formula here, the WK equals SR max, and um, multiply it by these two strains. And then um, those two strains are sort of shown on these two on this on this slide here. I won't go into how to derive this equa these equations in any more detail, but if you do look at the Tem Thomas Telford notes, um, you will find that there is a detailed description given in there if you are interested in figuring out exactly how you get that equation. It's it's a couple of pages pages devoted to that. It's, I think you need a little bit of spare time to be able to go through it. <coughs> So that's how you would go about doing the crack width calculations um, using the formula in the Eurocode. But as I said, um, 
those formula are really only applicable if you've got a rectangular method, or a rectangular beam rather, if I can learn how to speak correctly. Um, if you've got a circular section, it's, you start, you're going to have to start adapting them, and, <coughs> and it's not um, quite as easy as you might think. Or, um, so, you, there is also a very a simple method given in the Eurocode, and um, this is covered in clause 7.33, of the Eurocode, and um, it just this just this method will just require the calculation of the reinforcement using the cracked section analysis, and then calculating what the stresses in your reinforcement are, and from there you then um, use these two tables, which are tables 7.2 and 7.3 in the Eurocode, um, to then calculate what your um, crack requirements are. Um, <coughs> So basically, to give you an idea how to use um, these two tables, um, let's just say that we've got a piece of reinforced concrete that we've done some stress calculations for, and we've come up with our stress in our reinforcement of 240 MPa. So um, once we've got that, we then go um, to the first table here, um, and then read across from the steel stress, um, across to the um, 0.3 millimeter crack width, because that's generally the crack width requirement that we'll be looking at. And from that, we find that our maximum bar spacing is 200 uh, millimeters. Alternatively, we can then we can also use um, this table, and for the same 240 MPa steel stress, we can read across here for the 0.3 uh, millimeter um, crack width. We find our maximum bar size is 16 millimeters. Um, basically from that, it basically means that you can either have a maximum bar spacing of 200 millimeters, and you, you can put in sort of t B 20 bars at 200 millimeters, and you comply with this, that requirement, or you can say I'm going to use the so 16 millimeter uh, maximum bar size and put them in at sort of closer centers. You, you don't have to comply with both of those tables. You only have to comply with one of them. <clears throat> um, so you can see by doing that and just checking that you comply with the table, that's actually a lot quicker than spending three pages trying to do the detailed crack width calculations. And um, strangely enough, this will actually give you a more economic answer as well. So you end up with less steel and less time. So. I can't see very many contractors out there encouraging you to do a detailed crack width analysis, really. It's not really saving anything by it. <coughs> so just something to be aware of, really. And I would recommend that you use this method if you possibly can, because it is, it's a lot easier. And you don't... If... So you could put 16 to 250 at the right Well, you, you can, if you had 16 to 250, um, and you got that stress in the bar, then you could use it. Um, that would be fine. Because as I said, you only, uh, you only have to comply with one of the tables. You don't have to comply with both. Um, I've already said that, so I'll skip over that slide. Um, the next thing we'll do is we'll just go through a quick example to illustrate the, um, uh, the direct calculation. Um, as I said, this is illustrating the sort of complicated method. Um, generally speaking, you're probably better off using the simpler method. But if you do um, happen to end up in a situation where you do want to do the direct calculation, um, this is how you would then go about doing it. Um, so basically, we've got a simple sort of slab that's a meter wide, it's 250 meter, millimeters deep, and we've got a 50 millimeter cover. And we've got our sagging moment of 85 kilonewton meters per meter. <coughs> Um, and we've got some general other assumptions given there about various exposure classes of being XC1 and the stress in the reinforcement, which is 247 um, MPA. Okay, so the first thing we'll do here is um, sort of look at the sort of crack width um, calculations. Um, <coughs> We have a cover of 50 mil millimeters, a bar diameter of 16 millimeters, and um, therefore we can calculate that we've got a little d, uh, or effective depth of 192 um, millimeters, which is just um, 250 minus 50 minus um, half the bar diameter. Um, 
we've already done the calculation, said the neutral axis depth is um, 63.5 millimeters. Um, and so the next thing we'll do is um, go on to the sort of reinforcement ratio within the section, which is just um, this equation 7.10 from the Eurocode. Um, there is an allowance in that equation for pre-stressing, but we don't have any pre-stressing within this section, so that um, part of the equation is just zero. So what we end up with is AS divided by the effective concrete area. Um, so we, we um, sort of calculate the reinforcement area, and um, we calculate the effective tension area, um, and um, that's just given in um, this part of the calculation there. And we find an effective height of the section of 62.2, multiply that by the meter width, and we end up with um, an AC effective of 62.2 times 10 to the 3 millimeter squared per meter. From that, we can then calculate the re reinforcement ratio of, of the section, which comes to 0 0.0323. Um, the next thing we'll do is um, find out what K1 and K2 are. K1 is 0.8 for high bond bars, and again, that's just given in the Eurocodes, and K2 um, is equal to 0.5, and um, that's just for the typical bending situation, again, given straight in the Eurocode. Um, so once we have all those parameters, um, we can then calculate SR max, um, and that's just given at the bottom of the slide here, and we end up with a maximum spacing of 254.2 um, millimeters between um, the cracks occurring. Um, the reinforcement um, stress, assuming a free, fully cracked section, is 247.6 um, MPA. So the minimum value um, is based on that is based is um, then 0.7428 times 10 to the negative three, um, and that's just taking into account that part of the equation. There, um, this um, strain equation is again just given taken straight from the Eurocode itself. Um, together with that limitation, limitating value at the end of the equation. Um, we then have to calculate that full um, bit in the middle there, and um, again we just get all the different parameters straight from the Eurocodes, and we calculate that um, epsilon SM minus epsilon CM is 0 0.902 times 10 to the negative 3, which is bigger than the minimum value, and therefore um, we use that. And once we've then calculated that, um, we can then calculate the maximum crack width, which is um, 0.23 millimeters, which is less than the 0.3 millimeter required by the code. So um, this equation, um, or this um, particular example, it com complies with the requirements of the Eurocode. But as I said earlier, generally speaking, um, you probably won't use this method. You just um, take your stress um, of 247. Um, M MPA, and you'd go straight to um, these equations back here, and you just sort of read off the table to um, de determine whether or not you comply with the situation you've got, um, which again um, you would do for this. The 0.3 millimeters. Yes. Yeah. It's given in the Eurocode. Yeah, I mean. The, the practice that you just calculated, mm -hmm. is it what, what distance from the reinforcement away from the reinforcement? Is it at the cover of 50 millimeters or, or where is it? Because in DS 400 we have some distance like 35 millimeters or something. If we had like no, it is, it is based on actual cover. Because um, what we've got in DS 500 is we had DS 8500 yeah. coming in yeah. and adding on a whole bunch of extra cover. Exactly. Um, so it's these the these equations are based on the covers that are given in the Eurocodes, but we've still actually ended up with a bit of a mess in the UK because our covers in the UK are still governed by BS five four hundred, or not BS five four hundred, by BS eight five hundred. The ones in BS eight five hundred, I'm afraid. If the cover is seventy five, you put that seventy five in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we will talk about the cover part in a couple of sessions from now. Uh, we'll go over that in a bit more detail. Um, and how, how you go about it, but trust me, in the UK we've ended up in a mess. <laughs> um, deflections, um, this is covered by um, clause 7.4 um, in the Eurocode, and basically um, you've got the basic principle that starts this off, 741, 
And this just requires that the defamation of a member or structure shall not adversely affect its proper functioning or appearances. Um, it then goes on to say that excessive defamations under permanent actions can make the structure appear under strength and um, can disrupt various sort of services within the structure. Uh, and basically what that means is if you've got a bridge and it sags too much, if you've got drainage going through the bridge, you end up with all your water sitting in the middle of the bridge and you probably don't want that. Um, particularly since it's adding more load and the drainage engineers probably go get upset. Um, so um, generally you can also end up with things like live load deformations can also damage surfacing and waterproofing and can also lead to dynamic problems. Um, and that these dynamic problems can be both um, sort of permanent structural problems or they can also, <laughs> also lead to um, discomfort to the user, both of which, which we would rather avoid. Um, you don't really want pedestrians going across a bridge and getting seasick, or in this case, bridge sick. <coughs> and you don't want the thing sort of deforming permanently either. And but basically, because of these reasons, um, the Eurocode 2 does require that the flexion limits should be established for each structure, um, considering what these limitations are. Um, but again, for, bri for bridges, it doesn't give that much of a guidance of how much deformation um, you are allowed. It's one of those things that sort of tells you you need to consider it, but you have to consider it on a bridge-by-bridge -bri -bridge basis. So basically, you to design your bridge so it doesn't sag so much that the drainage gets disrupted, and you also have to take into account um, sort of various aerodynamic effects. There is a bit of um, guidance given on those, however, um, in, in sort of the loading parts of the structure, but um, not so much for the actual deformation bits themselves. <coughs> um, the deflections should also be calculated following the rules in clause 743. Um, in practice, it's usually necessary to calculate the deformation of concrete bridges in order to um, calculate things like rotations and tr translations um, in the design of things, particularly bearings. I mean, you have to know exactly how much the bridge is rotating and deforming to be able to design your bearings. You need taking those into account um, anyway. And um, clause 743 also requires that actions and structures and structural behavior is assessed realistically and to an accuracy merited by the type of bridge of check being carried out. And then the remainder of this clause then goes on to give recommendations of how you achieve a realistic calculation for that. Um, and that includes taking into account things that are included on this slide here, like the consideration of the shrinkage curvature, using an effective modulus of elasticity um, to allow for creep and, and things like that. It's all summarized there. Um, so that's it on deflection. Um, we'll now just finish off with early thermal cracking. Uh, and basically, early thermal cracking is just the cracking that occurs in concrete members um, due to restraint as the heat of hydration dissipates and while the concrete is still young. So basically, as the concrete dries, it, it has a tendency to crack. And um, you have to take into account um, both the internal and external restraint when you do that. And both of these are defined on this slide here. Um, as I said there earlier, um, early thermal cracking isn't covered very well by the Eurocode. Um, Eurocode 1992 Part 1 um, and Part 2, the bridge and building section, doesn't actually mention it at all. Um, you actually have to go into um, Eurocode 1992 Part 3 for water retaining structures um, where there's sort of partial coverage of early thermal cracking um, given in the code and in the UK National Annex. <coughs> um, you'd probably find in the future that we'll have to sort of use the recommendations given in there and we probably have to use the recommendations given in the Syria Guide as well to be able to take into account the early thermal cracking just because it um, really isn't um, covered very well at all by um, the Eurocodes themselves. So.